Amen. Job chapter 13, verses 13 through 18. It is on the screen overhead for those in the building who have not uh, brought their Bible today. And the word of the Lord reads today from the King James text, Job 13, 13 through 18. Hold your peace. Let me be alone that I may speak. And let come on me what will. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in mine hand? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation. For a hypocrite shall not come before him. Hear diligently my speech and my declaration within your ears. Behold, now I have ordered my cause. I know that I shall be justified. Hallelujah. Father, we love you, God, so very much. And as always, we are grateful for that time in our service, Lord, when the word of God, the bread of life, is broken for the benefit of your people. And Lord, today I once again am struggling immensely with my allergies. And Lord, the word of God promises that in our weakness you're made strong. You don't need to remove every obstacle, Lord, because in the midst of the obstacle your strength is manifested. And Lord, today in the name of Jesus, I ask God that you would anoint your messenger. Help me, O oh Lord, to be a blessing and a help and an encouragement to the people of God. Allow the word of the Lord to spring forth from my lips, not the opinions of men, not my man-made doctrine nor dogma. But let the word of God today Pour from me as a willing vessel. And Lord, touch every ear and every heart. Let everyone in this place, everyone watching by reason of the internet, let each and every one, God, not only hear the words, but receive the word. And let that word today become engrafted upon the table of our heart that we might walk about as living epistles, not just professing Christ, but rather, O oh God, demonstrating Christ and reflecting Christ to an unsaved world. We ask it all in that precious saving name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. <clears throat> Pardon me. You'll notice the minute I lubricate a little bit with water, you know, my voice uh, gets a little better. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Job chapter 13, verses 13 through 18, is Job's response to some of his friends who are bringing accusation against him because God knows that nothing bad can come into your life except, of course, God is somehow punishing you or cursing you for something you've done that you shouldn't be doing. That is the mindset. How often do we see this idiotic mindset, even in leaders in the Christian community? Every storm that comes, every wildfire in California, we got Pat Robertson announcing that it's because Ellen uh, was host of the Oscars, or it was because this, or it was because of that. And these foolish preachers, I just wish that those under the sound of my voice today would grow up spiritually and learn to recognize that when these preachers are talking like this, they are talking, listen to me, spiritually, they're talking like a bunch of one-year-olds. 
I don't care how long Pat Robertson's been on TV. I don't care how long Franklin Graham has been preaching. I don't care how long some of these preachers have been involved in so-called ministry. When they constantly try to attach a cause to an effect, they're demonstrating that spiritually they're peons. Spiritually, they're immature. Spiritually, <laughs> they're not the least bit grown up. Because the truth of the matter is, you don't have to do nothing for bad things to come into your life. The Word of God said, God causes the rain to be poured out on the just and the unjust. Mm -hmm. yep. You see, in other words, life is going to deal all of us positive times and every one of us are going to experience negative times there are times every, the only difference is as believers we got him walking with us hallelujah yes, the amen. only thing is as believers we've got God to turn to we've got a heavenly father we can go to just like when you were a kid and you got sick who'd you run to mommy or daddy because you knew that they could do something about it you had more confidence in your mommy and daddy than you had in the doctor you had more confidence in your mommy and daddy than you did the emergency room and I tell the truth mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you as children of God today we walk in fellowship and in relationship with the Lord and for that reason we need not be afraid we need not be concerned we need not hide from our troubles when they come our way we need not look for a cause we need not assume we've done something wrong no Bad stuff happens. You know, there's, there's a, a fellow that wrote a book when bad stuff happens to good people. You know, it happens. Mm -hmm. People are perfectly good. Well, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Job had friends like we all have friends, and friends think sometimes they're helping us. Have <laughs> you ever had a friend thought they were helping you, and you sat there and said to yourself, I wish you'd just go away? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You ever had a conversation with your mother, and your dad, and and you know, and you're going through something? Maybe you just broke up from your first girlfriend, your first boyfriend, you know, and they're telling you stuff, and everything they're telling you may be right as rain, or it may be wrong as thunder, but you're still sitting there saying, "Just shut up." I really am not in the mood to hear this right now. Well, friends sometimes, people in our families, they're trying to help. They're, 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 they think they're being helpful. And Job's friends thought they were being helpful because all this calamity had befallen Job. His children, his cattle, his homes had all been destroyed. He was left destitute. Now he's sick. He's got sores all over his body. He's suffering miserably. And his friends come to him and they're trying to help. Well, Job, you must have done something awful bad for God to do this to you, son. What you need to do is you need to really do some self-reflection. You really need to look into your own self and see if you can identify what you did so you can repent of it. And then that way God can restore you and God can heal you and the Lord can get you back where you need to be. Because obviously all this negativity, my God have mercy, it just has to be. Mm -hmm. It just has to be God is putting all this on you. Well, the interesting thing is in our primary text, Job answers them and he said, hold your peace. We'd say, I shut up. We'd say, be quiet now. He said, let me alone that I may speak. And let come on me what will. He said, you know what, whatever's coming, let it come. Boy, I want to tell you, we don't have very many Christians in the world today have that attitude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got to admit, oh Lord, I hate when the preacher has to confess while he's preaching. <laughs> Doggone it, Lord, why do you do this to me? It's not fair. There are times I'll say to Tommy, I got 
this health issue, I got that health issue. Then I turn around and I'm diagnosed with cancer. Good God have mercy. How much does the Lord expect me to go through? How much of a trial does he expect? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying I don't believe he's going to bring me through. I'm not saying that. But just because he's going to bring you through don't mean you necessarily want to go through it. I didn't want to go in <laughs> And I've said to Tommy, I'm not going to stand up here. I'm going to tell you something. I've told y'all, I try to be as, as transparent and as real a preacher as I can be. I grew up listening to preachers to hear them tell it they could walk on water and they could raise the dead. I mean, to hear them tell it they never had any issues in their life. They never wrestled with being human. They never had, you know, because they sure enough aren't going to tell you about it. Because God forbid you look at the preacher as being a human being. Honey, I'm supposed to lead the church by example. Sometimes the best thing in the world that a teacher can do or that a parent can do is set an example for the kid. Well, I'm here to tell you, the Bible said, confess your faults one unto another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Well, I'm confessing the fault. Yeah, there are times that I, I don't say like Job said, hey, let come on me what may. Lord, just pour it on. Whatever you got, let it come. No, I, I can't say I always feel that way. There are many times I say, okay, Lord, uh, any minute now you can shut off the spout because I've gotten real wet and I'm tired and I don't think I can handle any more than I'm already handling. But Job said, and let come on me what will listen. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in mine hand? Verse 15, though he slay me, Yet will I trust him. Job said, even if God decides to kill me, I'm going to trust him. He knows what he's doing. I'm going to tell you, if God takes me tomorrow, he knows what he's doing. If the Lord decides to take you out of this life tomorrow, honey, he knows what he's doing. You know what? There may be stuff coming down the pike that he don't want you to have to go through. There may be stuff coming down the road that he may not want you to have to suffer through. That he may not, that he knows, listen to me now, he knows there's stuff coming down the road that might overcome you. And that would cause you to forfeit your salvation. Say, no, I know that trial would be a little bit too hard for him to go through. Or that trial would be a little bit too hard. That would crush her. I, I can't let her go through that. So you know what? If you understand how this thing works, and obviously Job did, he understood that death was a promotion. <laughs> it wasn't a punishment. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Hey, even if God, Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. said, either way, I'm all right. Either way, I, I, I got it going on, honey. I'm going to tell you something. When they come to me in the hospital in 2000 and ask me the question, and if you've ever been deathly ill, then you understand what I'm talking about. I don't know if all hospitals do it, but they did at Yale New Haven Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. They had their psych students that would come around to the room and they would literally walk in the room. The doctors have told you they're not sure if you're going to live. You're not, they're not sure if you're going to survive. And this psychiatry or psychology student walks in and says, Hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm a student here. Blah, blah, blah. Are you aware that you may die? Uh-huh. And then the next question for the average person, it would sound like about the dumbest question anybody could ask you, right? How do you feel about that? <laughs> well, now, how are most people going to feel about that? I was 34 years old, almost 35, laying in a hospital bed, a Yellow Haven hospital, and a young man comes in, a psych student, and asks me, are you aware that you may die yet? How do you feel about that? I said, honey, I'm good either way. 
I'm prayed up, fired up, and ready to go up. I said, I believe there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. I've put my confidence in Jesus. I've got a ticket for the glory train. I'm ready to enter heaven. I want to walk the streets of gold. I want to see grandma again. I want to see great grandma again. I said, oh, I'm ready. And he looked at me and said, I've never, ever, ever seen anybody respond like that. After a while, they come back to my room and, long story short, spent three hours with me talking. Finally, he said, well, my shift's over, so I need to go. He said, but I've never talked to anybody that responded to those questions the way you did. I had to come in and talk to you about it. And I said, well, bless your heart. I said, you wasted the last three hours of your shift talking to me. He said, no, I wasted the last one hour of my shift. The last two hours have been on me. Why? He said, because I've never had anybody that had such peace and such confidence and was so secure that the notion of death, he said, you didn't even cry one tear. You didn't shed one tear. He said, you didn't react like there was anything in the universe to be afraid of. Or I said, honey, there ain't. I said, if I preach what I preach and I don't believe it, then there's something wrong. I said, but I got news for you, kid. I said, every word I preach, I believe, and every word I believe, I preach. Job said, though he slay me. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's, there's a powerful truth in what Job says in that phrase. That I think a lot of preachers, I know growing up as a kid, I'd hear them talk, oh, though he slay me, well, I trust him, hallelujah. Oh, they make some big spiritual thing out of it. Um, notice this. Job acknowledges that whatever is happening to him is at the hand of God. He doesn't blame the enemy for nothing. You don't hear Job saying, If the Lord allows the devil to kill me, I'll still trust him. I'm going to tell you, I grew up in the Pentecostal church, and... People were so in the habit of everything that come into their life negative. It was the devil. It was the devil. It was the devil. It was the devil. It took a lot of years for me to get that crapola pushed out of my spirit. It took a long time for me to finally learn that there ain't nothing in your life. Oh, listen to me, children. If you're a child of God, if you're a born-again believer, there is nothing in your life that isn't there because of God. Not because of the enemy. Satan didn't plant it in you. You're being LGBT, honey. Uh-uh. That was not an issue of the devil brought it on you, and you got to fight it and overcome it. No, no. If it's, oh, hallelujah. Yes, if it's amen. there, it's there because God let it be there. Amen. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Paul said, there was given unto me a thorn in the flesh. There was given unto me a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. But where did Paul say that thorn in the flesh originated? It originated from God's hand. He said it was given unto me. He didn't say the enemy attacked me. He said God gave it to me. God gave me a devil. Sure enough, he sure did. Well, why in the world would God do that? I'll tell you why. The answer comes later in that passage. As Paul goes to the Lord. He said three times, I pray, God, remove this from me. Oh, Lord, remove this from me. How many of us have stuff in our lives? We beg God to remove it, and it doesn't get removed. And then finally, if we're blessed, we'll come to the revelation and the understanding. We'll listen to the voice of God, and we'll get it. Because my grace is sufficient for you. You see, the message this pastor preaches ain't the same as they preach at other affirming churches. It's not the same as they preach at First Church up the road. No, the, pre the message this preacher preaches is God's grace is sufficient 
for you. Your being straight, honey, ain't going to get you into heaven. I got news for you. You can try to be straight all till the cows come home. It ain't being straight ain't going to get you into heaven. I got further news. It ain't going to keep you out. Uh, being gay ain't going to keep you out. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's Amen. Right. What's going to keep you out is a failure to learn to rest in God's grace, to rely upon God's grace. That issue may be in your life if for no other reason but to help you learn to rely upon the grace of God. There's a lot of people, I grew up in Pentecost, I keep saying it over and over, I grew up in Pentecost, you know, I, I was part of the holiness movement where you got to earn your place in heaven by wearing your hair a certain way and wearing certain kind of clothes and going to certain places and not going to other places and so on and so forth. Well, I'll tell you a little secret. I don't care what they say. I've been there, honey. Don't tell me. Don't. You know, there's an old saying, you can't kill a kidder. Mm -hmm. You can stand here and baloney me all day and all night. I know for a fact when I was in that movement that I was not relying upon the grace of God to get me into heaven. I was relying upon my own efforts. And every single person in that movement, unless they're lying to themselves like a dog, they know they're relying on their own efforts. Mm -hmm. yep. I'll tell you something. Having an issue in your life that you feel like is bigger than God can be the best thing that ever happened to you. Because that issue reminds you, you know what? You can't rely, you can't trust yourself to get into glory. So you better just rest in his grace. You better just trust his grace. Do the best you can to live for him. Do the best you can to be the best uh, uh, representative of his that you can be in a lost and dying world. God didn't ask you to be perfect. He asked you to be his representative. Amen. He didn't ask you to be him. He asked you to reflect him. He asked you not to be him, but to be like him. Hello now. He said, the servant cannot be greater than his master. He said, and the master doesn't ask his servant to be like him. Hello now. God news for you. God never asked you to be perfect. God never asked you to walk on water. God never asked you to part the Red Sea. God never asked you to do these things. That is a false narrative. That is a false doctrine. I grew up in the fundamentalist church. I know what I'm talking about. That is a pile of manure, folks. <laughs> All God ever asked you to do was be his representative. If you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind, then be the best representative of Christ you can be within the context of who you are. Amen. Don't try to be something you're not. If there's an issue in your life that seems like it's bigger than you and bigger than God, God may very well have put it there. So that every day and every way, you remember, I ain't going to make it except for his grace. Hallelujah. The only way I'll make heaven is by the grace of God. Because on my own efforts, I know I can't do it. How do I know I can't do it? Well, honey, Jesus said, you can't even turn one of your own hairs on your head white. He said, you, there are things you can't do. You can't even just, you can't even turn the hair on your own head white. Well, honey, if you can't do that, you sure enough can't make yourself straight. <laughs> Hello now. But you see, the truth of the matter is, I say, Lord, I tried to make myself straight. I tried to make myself right. I tried to do what I thought I was supposed to do, but I couldn't do it. Yep. And the Lord turns around and says, uh-huh then maybe you'll learn the lesson that I'm not asking you to do it. I'm asking you to trust my grace. That's right. That's right. My Lord, have mercy. But Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's a powerful message in there. Job said, though he slay me. Not though the devil sleep. Grow up in the Pentecostal church, every time something bad come down the pike, oh, the enemy's hitting me. Oh, I've been sick with allergies. That's the devil. Oh, 
I've been sick. Oh, I was diagnosed with this. I was like, oh, the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil. And many, many, many years ago, I said something to my mother uh, on that line. I don't remember what it was. Now, Mom, I'm giving you a little bit of credit here. So be appreciative. <laughs> and I'll never forget it. For some reason, this stuck in my head. And my mother said to me, Boy, the enemy sure is powerful in me. Well, you know what, Mother? You told me that when I was probably a teenager, and it took me well into my adult life before it finally clicked. And I realized, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm a child of God. I've been bought with the blood of the Lamb. I have been sealed by the Holy Ghost into the kingdom of heaven. How in the world am I giving the devil all this credit? How in the world am I constantly giving the enemy credit for every negative thing that comes my way? No, anything that comes my way, good or bad, comes from God. Yes. God, the enemy, Satan, had to stand before God and get permission before he could bring anything into Job's life. That's right. right. That's correct. Bill, that old devil had to stand in front of the Lord before he could bring anything in your direction. <laughs> he had to get permission from the Lord before he could bring anything in my direction. I've got to remember that. I've got to remember what Job said, though he slay me. I've got to remember that every circumstance, every situation, everything that comes into my life originates with God. It does not originate with the enemy. And here Job's friends are trying to help him realize why it is that God is cursing him. Now, God ain't cursing him. The Lord's allowing him to go through some things. I'm going to tell you, sometimes God ain't cursing you. He's not punishing you. He's trying to help you go through some things because when you get on the other side of those things, your faith is going to be somewhere that your faith never was before. See, your faith cannot grow until your faith has been tested. Now, you can either have the same faith leaving this life that you had coming into the truth, or you can have greater faith, stronger faith, more faith than you had when you first come into this thing. I don't know about you, Johnny, but I want more. I want greater. I want stronger than what I started with. You remember the story of the men that the Lord gave talents to? And one of them took and buried his talents and the other ones invested their talents so they'd get more. And when their master returned, they were able to present more to him than what they started with. You know what? That's an allegory. That's helping us understand faith. You can either bury what you got and have no more than what you started with when Jesus comes, or you can invest it. You can say, here am I, Lord. Whatever I must go through, I'm going to trust you. Whatever you bring into my life, I'm going to trust you. Whatever happens with me, I will believe you and I will trust you. And you're going to go through some things, but you're going to go through. Those things are not going to take you down. Those things are not going to destroy you. No, no, no. You'll go through them. You'll get to the other side. Is it going to be fun? No. It's kind of like when I was a kid, I remember... Some of my friends or family members would want to go in the haunted house. You remember going to the old uh, carnival or the old circus or whatever? And they'd have a, a big old trailer that they'd open up and it'd be a haunted house, you know, and you'd ride a little roller coaster through. I never was necessarily a big fan of those things. I'd get in that car and I'd just be, you know, squinting and... I thought, oh, Lord, I, I probably am not going to want to open my eyes the whole ride. And I'd just be scared to death going through that whole stupid experience. But I knew that if I held on long enough, Bill, that that car was going to roll back out into the daylight. And I'd get off the ride, and nothing that was in there that scared me while I was there was going to scare me again. Am I telling the truth? <laughs> See, I know... <laughs> 
<clears throat> when God asks me to go through some things, I know I'm going to go through. I know it is just a test of my faith. He's not testing me. Listen to me. He's not testing you. The Bible said God cannot be tempted, nor can God tempt. See, God's not tempting you to fail, because God has no intention of your failing. He doesn't want anything to cause you to fail. But just like mom or dad sometimes says, Honey, I know you don't want to do this project at school. I know it scares you to get up in front of people and speak. I know you're not comfortable with that. But your teacher wants you to do this oral book report, and you need to do it. Now, I can go to the school and make excuses for you and try to get you out of it, but you need to do it. Well, I don't want to do it. I'm scared. I don't like getting up in front of people and talking. Well, let me tell you something. There's going to be times in your life when you got to get up in front of people and you got to talk. And you don't know what kind of job you're going to get as you grow older and stuff. And there ain't nothing worse in the world than somebody having a job where they need to get up and talk in front of people. And they're so scared and they're so timid and they're so mousy that they get up there and they hem and they haw and they stutter and they spit. And you got to sit there and listen to it. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Oh, I've sat and listened to people, and I've just prayed that God would strike them dead. Because <laughs> I, was, I, was just, I was just at my wit's end. <laughs> like, Lord, please deliver me from this guy. God have mercy. Nowhere in his life did he ever learn to find the nerve to just get up in front of a few people and talk. But you know what? That's a good skill to have. So mom and dad sometimes will encourage you, do it. You need to do it. Why? Because it'll help you develop a skill that'll serve you better later in life. Am I telling the truth? That is why God allows... I had a feeling Johnny was going to pet him like that. But, <laughs> but uh, I had, uh, there are times when God... What number does it show, Booby? You're trying to sign in. Um, 67, I think. All right. There you go. I should have done it. Um, so there are times God wants us to go through things, but he doesn't want us to go through it so it'll destroy us. He wants us to go through it so we'll be better equipped and so our faith will grow and our faith will develop. Oh, Job had friends. Thank God for friends. You know the old saying, if it weren't for friends, thank God for friends like this with friends like this who needs enemies, right? Mm -hmm. And Job continues and he says to his friends, He also shall be my salvation, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. So you know what else Job said? Job said, listen, I'm not the least bit concerned about my walk with God. I'm not the least bit concerned that God in the end is going to come through for me. You know why? Because while y'all standing here trying to tell me I must have done something wrong and I must have brought this on myself, I know I didn't. Said so now a hypocrite, somebody who talks one thing and walks something different, he said they might have something to worry about. He said, but honey, I'm telling you what, I know for a fact you ain't talking to a hypocrite. So you might as well just hold your peace. You might as well just keep your mouth shut. You know, the Bible said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When you know you're doing the best you can do, and you're living for the Lord, and you're giving God the best you can give him, then, honey, you don't have to worry about whether or not God's going to hear your prayer. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're going to come out the other side of the burning, fiery furnace. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're going to survive the lion's den. You will. You will. And Job said, listen, I know what happens to hypocrites. And I know that I don't have anything to worry about. Boy, I'm going to tell you, there's something to be said when you're living this thing honestly and sincerely. 
And you don't claim perfection, but you know that under the circumstances, you're doing the best you can do. Hello now. <laughs> In Job chapter 1, verse 20 through 22, the word of the Lord says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. When is Job doing this? Immediately after hearing of all the calamity, all the disaster and the destruction that has come upon his life. And Job rents his mantle, he tears his clothes, he shaves his head, he falls down upon the ground and worshipped. Good grief. Half of us be on the phone calling everybody complaining about, Oh Lord, you wouldn't believe what all's going on with me right now. Oh Lord, I'll tell you, I just need support. I mean, Job's first response was, It's time to have church. It's time to worship God. I'm going to tell you, there have been times in my life I've gone through some things, some terrible things, some hard things. And it was time for church. And I'm going to tell you, instead of sitting at home moaning and groaning and griping and grumping about things, I knew it was time to worship God. And I went to the house of the Lord and I worshiped Him anyway. Hallelujah. There's an old song that said, Hallelujah, anyhow. I said, Lord, I'm going to worship you. It don't matter what's going on. My allergy driving me up the wall today. I'm barely about able to breathe. But you know what? I'm going to worship God. And when you saw me up here, I was worshiping the Lord like I was feeling fine. You know why? Because ain't nothing going to stop me from worshiping Jesus. Amen. Nothing. Job fell down on the ground and worshiped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. And naked shall I return thither. He said, listen, I come into this thing with nothing, and I'm going to leave this thing with nothing. So the fact that I lose everything I had in the middle of my life, oh well, I come in naked, I'm going to leave naked. Then he went on to say, listen, I'm telling you, this is powerful today. Naked came I into this out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. What does that tell you? It tells you Job knew as long as he was walking hand in hand with Jesus that he was in good hands. So let me tell you something. He said, let me tell you, the Lord gave and the Lord took away. Notice he didn't say the Lord gave and the enemy took away. No. All throughout the book of Job, Job remembers every step of the way that it is God's hand that guides his life, not the enemy. That it is God in control of his life. Oh, children, I'm going to tell you, if Christians would understand this principle, it'll change your world. It took me years to come to this understanding. But when you quit looking at every negative thing that comes upon you as being the enemy and the devil, because when you keep looking at, at, at it that way, then you're giving the enemy power in your life he does not have. You're giving him credit for things he doesn't deserve credit for. Job so said, no, the Lord gave the blessing of my children, the blessing of my homes, the blessing of my wealth, the blessing of my cattle, all that came from God. And when all that was taken away, guess who did it? God did it. He said, I'm in good hands. I know whose hands I'm in. I know who's in charge of my life. It ain't the devil, it's the Lord. Job chapter 1 and verse 8, the word of God said, and the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? This is the same guy God is bragging on Job about 
He's, he's the best I got. There ain't another man on the planet as good as this guy. And his friends are telling him, what'd you do wrong? Where'd you screw up? God must be punishing you, the Lord. Oh, I'm telling you, the enemy just coming after you, Job. You must have done something wrong. But look what God had to say about Job. Did God say Job had made any mistakes? Did God say Job was anything less than he claimed to be? Did God say Job wasn't living what he claimed to live? Nope. He told the enemy, hey man, have you seen this guy? This is the best one I got on the whole planet. There is none like him in all the earth. Can you imagine? God is bragging on Job. I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes something comes into your life because God just finished bragging on you. See this guy here? He's gay. There are people in the church trying to tell him every day he can't be a Christian and he can't live for me and he can't worship me, that I'm not interested in him, that I don't want to hear from him, that I will not offer him fellowship, that I will not accept him. But you know what he does? He goes to church every Sunday anyway. You know what he does? He prays anyway. You know what he does? He worships anyway. Oh, I'm going to tell you that's some character I got right there. Devil, you need to look at this guy. He is something. Else. He don't let nobody talk him out of living for me. He don't let nobody convince him that my grace isn't big enough to meet every need in his life. He doesn't let nobody nor nothing push him out of my kingdom. The devil said, yeah, but if circumstances changed a little, he changes too. And the Lord said, oh, no, not Johnny. See, you don't know Johnny like I do. <laughs> Oh, no, not Bill. You don't know Bill like I do. You want to change the circumstance a little bit, devil? You think that'll turn you know, that'll turn him around? That'll make him turn his back on me and curse me? You want to try it? I'll give you permission to try it. See, that's how confident I am in him. The Word of God said God will not let anything come upon us greater than we're able to bear. You know what that means? That means if it comes... God has confidence in us that we can see it through. Did you hear what I said today? I'm going to tell you, there ain't nothing in the world better than daddy or mommy's confidence. Playing baseball as a kid, you know, I used to play Little League. My first year playing Little League, man, I stunk the field up so bad. Holy mackerel, I was the worst thing. I was scared to death of the ball, literally. I'm not joking. I was scared to death of the baseball. That thing, I'd be out in the outfield. You know, they'd put me off in left field, ho hoping nobody in the universe or right field, whatever it was, hoping nobody in the world would hit out to me because I was scared of that ball. If that ball come in my direction, I wasn't about to put my glove underneath it. No, that might sting. That might hurt my hand. Bill, I'd wait for that ball to hit the ground. Then I'd go get it and I'd throw it in. Oh, I was terrible. I was one of the worst players. I'd stand up at the plate and that pitcher pitch. I didn't swing one time. Not one time did I swing. Now, when I was home by myself with my brother Michael playing catch, and I'd swing then, you know, I, I, but it was only him there. I, I didn't have an audience of parents, and I didn't have other kids that I could be humiliated and embarrassed in front of. But you know, there's something about the confidence of mom or dad. It's amazing what you can do when mom or dad express their confidence in you. You can do it. You can do better. The second year came for us to play Little League. And my mother asked me, do you want to play this year? I said, no, I don't want to play this year. I made such a fool out of myself the year before. I wasn't about to play that year. She said, okay. I said, but why don't you keep practicing with Michael? Why don't you keep doing what you do with Michael? Michael played the second year. I didn't play the second year. So why don't you keep practicing? She said, because I know you can do it. I know you can figure this thing out. I know you can. I'm glad she knew it because I sure didn't. <laughs> well, you know what, Johnny? I didn't play the second year, but I practiced the second year. 
I practiced with my brother Michael. You know what? I learned that I could catch that ball, that it wasn't going to kill me. It wasn't going to explode in my hand like a hand grenade if I caught it. All of a sudden, you couldn't throw a ball at me that I couldn't catch. I'm not kidding. I'm as serious as a deck. All of a sudden, you couldn't throw a pitch I couldn't hit. They'd throw, they'd throw pitches trying to walk me. I'd knock that sucker all the way across the field because I learned how to stretch myself out and find that ball and hit it. And, I mean, it didn't matter where you threw that ball. I was going to hit that bugger. By the time the third year come around, my mother said, do you want to play this year? I said, yeah, I want to play this year. I had to go through the, the uh, process of, of uh, trying out, you know, and the team had to pick me. You talk about embarrassing. The team that picked me the first year didn't, didn't want me th that year. I'd been gone for a year, but they still didn't pick me for the third year, you know. Another team did. Instead of being on the A's, I'm going to be on the Eagles this time. Well, guess who the Eagles played the first game of the season? Mm -hmm. The A's, my former team. My first time up at bat. This is a true story. I knocked that ball out of the ballpark, literally. Home run, out of the ballpark, over the fence. I ran around them bases like the prissy little sissy that I am. <laughs> And, honey, I put my foot on that home base. And not only was my coach there to reach out to me and congratulate me, but so was the coach from the A's. And he said, man, why couldn't you do that for us? Because, see, I didn't have my confidence yet. I hadn't gotten my confidence yet. Thank God Mom had confidence in me that I could do it. Thank God her confidence encouraged me to keep trying. Am I telling the truth? I'm going to tell you something. When something comes into your life that seems bigger than anything you can handle, God has confidence in you. If he didn't have confidence in you, it wouldn't be in your life. Because the Word of God promises He doesn't allow anything to come our way that we are unable to bear. In Romans 8, 28, And we know, Paul said, I love this, he didn't say we believe, we suspect, we like to think. He said we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Paul said, we know this. We know we're in good hands. We know that there's nothing that comes our way that doesn't start with God, that doesn't originate with God. That if it comes our way, it's there ultimately to better us. Oh, I'm going to tell you, oh, I wish every chunk, I wish to God we had a much bigger church and a lot bigger audience on the internet. Because I guarantee you what I'm preaching right now, I didn't hear preached growing up. And I wish to God we could get this message out to the church world. Because if people would only learn what I'm trying to tell them right now, Job said, Though he slay me, they ain't nobody going to kill me but God. The devil doesn't have the power to do it. The enemy of my, in my life doesn't have the power to do it. Sickness doesn't have the power to do it. If it happens, it happens because God said so. You're in good hands when you're walking in relationship with the Lord. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to the purpose. Paul said, we know this. Hallelujah. We know this. And then Paul said, excuse me, in Genesis verse uh, 20, chapter 50, Joseph, after being sold into slavery and betrayed by his brothers 
and going through a lot of years of very difficult times, all of a sudden, there's famine in the land. And his family, his brothers have come into Egypt and they're looking for help. They're what you call refugees. They're saying, we're not Egyptians, we're Jews, we're Israelites, but we're Canaanites, but things aren't good where we've been. And we really need to be in a place where we can eat and we can have what we need. Would you please allow us? Would you please help us? And of course, there was Pharaoh Trump who said, No, get away from us, you foul, evil people. You murderers, you rapists, you killers. I'm teasing. Got to get away from that. Well, guess who is in charge by now? of things in the kingdom to such a high degree that he was just a couple notches under Pharaoh. Well, it was this guy who had been sold into slavery by his brothers. All of a sudden, Joseph standing in front of his brothers. Guess what? His brothers don't even recognize him. They don't know who he is. Back in the day, Egyptians used to, even the men used to wear facial paint sometimes, you know, cosmetics, you know. Who knows, maybe Joseph had makeup on him, maybe he was doing drag, and they couldn't see him for who he was. But listen to what Joseph said to them. See, he revealed himself to them. He said, by the way, guys, uh, let me tell you who I am. My name's Joseph. <laughs> Y'all sold me into slavery. Remember when you dug that big ditch and you threw me in that ditch and I didn't see you again until you brung somebody who wanted to buy me as a slave? Remember that? <laughs> I'm the guy. But here's what Joseph said. Genesis 50 and verse 20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good. See, even when something horrible come on me, the fact of the business is God already had a plan that this was going to work out well. Hallelujah. Oh, isn't it good to know when something bad comes your way that you know God's got something in the back of his mind good. He's already got. Why? Because we know that all things work together for good. Joseph said, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. To bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph said, y'all men evil. Y'all were trying to be dirty and trying to be nasty and trying to be wicked and trying to be evil. But you know what? God had a better plan on the other side. And now because of the evil you thought you were doing... I'm going to be able to be instrumental in saving many people's lives. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We get, <coughs> we get upset and we rage, and I'm as guilty as anybody. When we look at our current circumstance and we see who's in the White House today. But you know what? As sure as I'm alive, God's got a plan. We heard some prophetic words from this pulpit that the Lord said, I've got a plan. I know what I'm doing. You just need to trust me. Am I telling the truth? I'm going to tell you, that was scriptural. <laughs> that wasn't just the pastor up here barking. That was scriptural. God was trying to remind us, I've got a plan. You see, what the Republicans meant for evil, what these people meant for, they thought they were going to take over the government by hook or by crook. They thought they were going to use foreign influence in order to basically commit a coup in our country and take it over by force. And they're doing all these things. They're appointing all these demonic, devilish judges who are no more qualified to sit in the bench. I mean, we're talking some of those men... Johnny and Bill have never so much as heard a case in their life. They've never been a judge. They're attorneys. They've never sat as a judge. All of a sudden, Trump makes them a lifetime appointment to a federal bench. 
because idealistically they're screwballs, idealistically they're far-right wing nuts. I'm going to tell you a little secret. You don't got to worry about it. Because when it's all said and done, God's going to say, you know what, what they meant for evil? <laughs> I had a good plan worked out. I was doing something good. They were doing something evil. They thought they were in charge. The only problem is they ain't never been in charge. I've been in charge the whole time. I've peeled the mask off of church folk who claim to be Christians but don't want to act like Christians. I peeled the mask off of people who preach that they're defenders of holiness and righteousness, and yet they have no more interest in living holy or righteous than anybody on this planet. All they're interested in is power and wealth and influence. Listen, I want to tell you, you're in good hands today. If you're walking in relationship with God, you're in good hands today. Lastly, I'm...